Stanford University. Thank you, Miriam, and uh, thank you to the SNI committee. It's a real honor uh, to be here and speaking in front of you. So uh, as, a, as I like to start with this slide here, um, which is sort of the proverbial fountain of youth that uh, is a painting from Lucas Granach the Elder, a Renaissance painter who tried to illustrate um, this, this ideal that an old person, a frail person, maybe a sick person can enter this fountain of youth and emerge rejuvenated and young on the other side. Uh, we of course know that this does not exist, but what I would like to share with you today is uh, research from a number of different labs actually started by Tom Rando here at Stanford um, almost 10 years ago, suggesting that at least in mice, there may be ways to regenerate and rejuvenate multiple tissues as if there were some sort of uh, fountain of youth uh, in an organism present. And what I would like to discuss with you today is how we try to think about this and how we approach this at a molecular, cellular, and systems level. Now, aging con uh, concerns all of us, not everybody at the same level, if I look into the audience. Um, but life expectancy has increased dramatically in the past century. And you can see here in this uh, graph on the left-hand side, mostly probably to, due to hygiene, vaccination, and uh, the, the, the food that we had available, lifespan has almost doubled in the past 150 years. Um, and people across the globe are actually living past 65 years at unprecedented numbers. And this is true in all civilizations, not just in the developed world. But along with that comes an increase in the incidence of a number of age-related diseases concerning the brain, most uh, importantly, Alzheimer's disease. And you can see here these staggering numbers of people predicted to develop Alzheimer's disease and suffer from this devastating illness. And many of us probably know somebody who has this disease. That brings us to cognition. And of course, we are here because of cognition. And we also heard that evolution gave us the advantage of cognition. And again, if you look at this graph here, this shows sort of the longitudinal progression of different aspects of cognitive function. Um, the young folks still have a few uh, years or even decades of uh, uh, cognitive stability that do not make you appreciate that you're actually getting older. Uh, whereas uh, us older folks already start to feel some signs of cognitive uh, impairment or at least slowing down, if not uh, impairment. And so what is going on? What happens with the brain from a young person that is so powerful and is functioning um, to, to an old brain? We know that there are synapses that, that are disappearing with age, cells are being lost, and actually up to 100 grams of tissue is lost from a 20-year-old to a 90-year-old person. And along with that, as I said, the incidence of degenerative diseases starts to increase. So what is aging? I would like to first discuss sort of the concept of aging for half of my talk and then get specifically onto how we're trying to harness recent discoveries to, um, to try to understand brain aging or even uh, remedy brain aging or reverse aspects of it at least. So how can we study aging? Aging can be uh, uh, sort of divided up into multiple different cellular aspects. And you see here, um, seven of these that happen sort of at the inter intracellular level, such as genomic instability, telomere shortening, epigenetic alterations, and so forth. But then there are two here that are more at the systems level that are integrative hallmarks of aging, including stem cell exhaustion. So in every tissue of our body that has stem cells, these stem cells exhaust as we get older. And what I'd really like to focus on, focusing on is uh, intercellular communication and how that changes with age. So when we talk about intercellular uh, communication, what do we mean? We mean the, the, con the, the, the communication of cells within a, a given tissue, but also across tissues. And so if you have cell one here, the way you can communicate with cell two uh, outside of the nervous system's electrical uh, uh, information exchange is mostly by releasing proteins that are then recognized by a cell, cellular receptor and trigger a, a signaling cascade. 
The cell, second cell is then instructed to do a number of different things, such as survive, divide, differentiate, or die. And these um, signals are governed by a number of different groups of proteins that biologists have uh, divided into cytokines, chemokines, growth factors. But really, these are artificial divisions, and they're all basically proteins that are involved in intercellular communication. And while most of, uh, of the field focuses maybe on a few dozen of these most famous molecules, such as winds or interferons, um, um, uh, BDNF, NGF, and so forth, uh, there's probably three to 5,000 proteins that are involved in this intercellular communication network. And we're trying to really understand how they change with age and how we can potentially identify the most critical ones. So we want to see aging then at an organismal level and not look at brain aging in isolation because the brain is of course connected to the body. And so if the organism ages as a whole, it will affect the brain and vice versa. And really at the center of all these different tissues is the blood, if you will. The blood is the organ that connects all the different tissues. Obviously it ca carries cells such as red blood cells and white blood cells, but it carries this whole intercellular communication network. It carries factors that instruct, for example, a muscle to talk to the liver or to the heart, the brain to talk to other tissues. So we can then ask, if we want to understand organismal aging, does blood actually show changes of aging? Can we measure molecular changes in the blood that are associated with aging? And so the way we approach this is by looking at as many factors as possible uh, in different cohorts of humans or mice or in, in a model that I'll show you in a minute called parabiosis. So in these studies here, uh, we looked at over 400 samples, uh, plasma samples, from uh, healthy humans aged 20 to 106. So these were obtained from different collaborators. We measure now over 1,000 of these proteins involved in intercellular communication to try to discover a protein signature of aging. And what we find consistently is that roughly a third of the proteins change significantly from the youngest to the oldest individuals in these cohorts, suggesting that our body lives in a very different environment when it comes to understanding these signals and responding to them as an organism. When we do uh, molecular modeling or bioinformatics uh, tools to model aging and try to uh, identify the key factors that drive this response, um, we can do this actually five to ten different proteins. And this is really work from Benoit Lehallier, a postdoc and a bioinformaticist in the lab, who has spearheaded that and really brought it to another uh, a higher level. And I'll just show you a few examples of, of uh, what he can do. So he has a, a set of samples where he measures, in this case, uh, a few more than 100 proteins only in 150 individuals, age 20 to 100. And he tries to predict the relative age of a person. So on the x-axis, you have the chronological age, the actual age of a person. And then with this algorithm, trying to use as few factors as possible, we can try to predict the relative age of a person. And this is consistently the case uh, across different cohorts, and we can find which factors are actually um, continue to show the same effects of predicting relative age of a person. This is another cohort here uh, of 189 individuals, age 20 to 90. And then here we can use an entirely different platform and individuals from 20 to over 106 years of age. And the idea here is really to find consistency in these, in these uh, different samples and to have a proteomic platform and measurements that will, um, will really predict which factors are truly involved in aging. And you end up with a ranked list of factors such as this one here where we have five different cohorts measured with either this uh, Luminex-based, antibody-based platform called uh, Myriad RBM or this other platform that is based on uh, aptamers or uh, modified oligomers, if you will. And I listed a few of these factors here that some of you may recognize that uh, tend to show up 
at the top of these uh, predicting models of, of aging. And you see there's a lot of consistency. Not every group shows the same effect. Not every platform will identify the same factors. But we can come up with hits uh, that we can now test uh, in biological systems. But of course, this is all, what I showed you is all correlates of aging. It just shows that these factors are good correlates of uh, the aging process, but do they actually have a role in aging itself? Can they modulate uh, aging uh, and tissue aging in particular? And this is where this amazing model call comes in called parabiosis. I know it's a bit creepy, um, but it has actually been around for over 100 years. It was developed by Frank Baer um, in, uh, in, in uh, France uh, over 100 years ago. And what it basically is, is a, a form of a Siamese twin, if you will, in mice. And we induce this surgically by connecting the mice at the flank. So we make a cut in the flank of the mouse. We, we suture them together. And because this is an open wound, blood vessels, a capillary network will innervate this, this injury and form now what we call an anastomosis so that you have now exchange of blood from, in this case, a young mouse with an old mouse. So there's an exchange of factors now that allows us to ask questions about tissue aging. And you can, of course, imagine that this model can be used to study all kinds of different aspects of physiology. Um, and I, I mentioned before, Tom Randall was really the, the first in modern times to use this model to uh, study specifically muscle stem cell aging. So if you get older and you injure your muscle, it does not actually regenerate. The stem cells are exhausted. There's only a few left. And instead, you form scar tissue. But what he asked, he asked a question, is this governed by changes in the local milieu or even in the stem cell itself, the aging hallmarks that I showed you, or is it maybe factors in the wider organism, in the wider niche, in the tissue or beyond in the organism that are responsible for this or could reverse aspects of this muscle aging. And for this, he used this model where he now injured a muscle from an old mouse that was paired to a healthy young mouse. And what he observed is that old injured muscle regenerated and rejuvenated almost like a young muscle, suggesting that there are factors in blood that are sufficient to regenerate or rejuvenate uh, this old tissue. He also found similar effects in the liver, and he noticed that there was increased proliferation of cells in the brain. And this is really where our collaboration started um, about uh, eight years ago or so. Others then uh, have recently confirmed, Amy Wagers at Harvard confirmed, that this uh, muscle regeneration uh, is observed in this model. Um, Richard Lee at Harvard found similar effects in the heart. Um, effects in the pancreas were also reported. And we're now four labs that um, can see these effects using the parabiosis model uh, on the brain. So the way we do this typically, and again, this is adapted from Tom's protocol, we pair a three-month-old mouse, uh, which is equivalent to about a 20-year-old human, with an 18-month-old mouse equivalent to about a 65-year-old person. We leave them together for five weeks and then ask uh, questions regarding uh, molecular changes, cellular, subcellular changes, cellular changes, and so forth. So if we look now at these top factors, actually not just from human, but that also overlap um, with mice. So these are top factors that we have identified to change significantly with aging in mice and humans. And this is what you see uh, if you look at healthy young versus old mice. And now we ask, what happens to an old mouse? What happens to the levels of these factors in an old mouse that is exposed to a young environment? And remarkably, uh, what we observe is that the majority of these factors go in the opposite direction. So while the, most of the factors that we can measure that are sort of predictors of aging tend to go up as we get older, as mice get older, in this model, in an old mouse paired with a young mouse, the majority of these factors are reversed and they tend to go down. And um, this is, of course, what we want to understand. We want to understand what is going on here. And this is work for many, many different labs, as you might imagine. And we see very similar changes at a transcriptional level in multiple different tissues. 
I'll just give you an example here, or a couple of examples. Soluble insulin receptor insulin signaling has been implicated in aging by many different groups uh, for uh, many years already. And if we just compare here, so these are young, young pairs of mice or old, old pairs of mice, and you can see this factor goes up with age. But in the old mouse that is paired to a young, you get a significant reduction in the levels of this factor. The same, for example, for the soluble erythropoietin receptor goes up with age and is reversed significantly in the old mouse paired to the young. You also notice that there is a trend towards increased levels in some of these young mice uh, in, in this pair, suggesting that there are detrimental factors that can drive or accelerate aging. So we want to find out whether these factors are truly relevant for aging, and for that we started to collaborate with Anne Brunet with her killifish model. The killifish lives only six months of age, so these are projects that a student can actually take on or a postdoc, as opposed to doing these in mice where you have a lifespan of three to four years. We can, uh, modify, we can manipulate these genes um, in, in killifish, or we can also inject recombinant factors into mice. Now, which tissue do these aging factors originate from? This is work uh, spearheaded by Nick Sharma, a graduate student in the lab. And he also asks, do these tissues actually age differently? So if you look at the organism and you ask, from a young to an old organism, do all these tissue change in uh, uh, synchrony, or do some uh, tissues actually age faster and potentially drive the aging process? And so what um, Nick started to do in collaboration with Steve Quake's lab is to look at many different tissues in young mice and in old mice and RNA sequence, um, the transcriptome, to figure out in which tissue do you find most changes with age. And what he finds is in uh, fat tissue, specifically in subcutaneous adipose tissue, he finds the most dramatic changes in gene expression with age, followed by spleen, marrow, bone, uh, uh, um, uh, brown adipose tissue, kidney, and liver, and so forth. And already this suggests that aging at the transcriptional level is very different if it comes to different organs. He can then... Uh, try to find the factors that change consistently and significantly in multiple tissues and start to rank them. And you see here a ranked list. And you don't have to look at these individual genes. But what is really striking is that the yellow ones are all involved in chemokine signaling. Chemokines are small cytokines involved in, uh, mainly from the immune system, perspective in attracting immune cells to different sites of injury or inflammation, but they have also different effects in other tissues. They can pattern, for example, the nervous system, um, and, and uh, many other uh, functions have been identified. And then the other group of factors are complement proteins, and you've heard recently uh, from Ben Barris' lab that complement factors are key uh, molecules involved in synaptic pruning, but they again, of course, do a lot of different things in the immune system. But this way, we can hopefully start to identify tissues that age, but also individual players in this process. And if we then look at how these genes, or these networks of genes change across tissues, we can um, look first at every gene that changes in at least one tissue and say, this is a gene involved in aging. So we find about 2,800 such genes, and we can ask, how do they change do they go up, do they go down, and if they go up, do they go up in the same tissue, or in which tissues do they go up? And what you achieve is, a, a, is sort of a network, or a hairball, how some people call them. I'd like to call it a network, where you see, for example, that there is a very strong trend uh, in increased gene expression of aging genes between the bone marrow and the spleen, maybe not surprisingly. But these are very synchronous in a young animal, as it gets older, these go together. But then if you look in an aged mouse, that network changes dramatically. And you have now a very strong hub around the skin. Maybe that's what we see when we look at people and we say, how old are you? We guess based on the skin. And you can see the genes that change in the skin change also in the heart, in the liver, and in the lung, as well as in the bone marrow. So there seem to be changes that are 
sort of in synchrony happen across multiple tissues, and this is what we're trying to understand. You also can see, for example, the brain uh, is connected with multiple tissues in the young organism, but much weaker uh, correlations in uh, older tissues. So if we could identify the tissue that drives aging, maybe we could just rejuvenate that tissue or replace that tissue even. And we are pursuing some studies with Judy Shizero, for example, to look at people who get a young bone marrow transplant versus people who get an older bone marrow transplant. This is sort of an in vivo human model of heterochronic uh, transplantation, if you will. And the future is really then to focus on these top genes and, and tissues that change with age and see uh, how do these uh, genes change as we get older or as the mice get older, and then which ones can we actually affect with the parabiosis model? Can we accelerate them um, th so that they, um, that they change even more dramatically or more interestingly maybe, can we reverse uh, these, uh, these genes? And, and again, figuring out what are the key drivers of the aging process. But let me come then to the brain. What are the molecular and functional outcomes of young blood then on the brain? And this is work by actually a semi quo awardee, um, Salvi Leda, who was a graduate student in my lab and really spearheaded this whole, um, this whole work uh, in my lab and started to do the first parabiosis experiments and took them all the way to understanding behavior uh, and electrophysiological changes. So what Saul asked is how is the old brain that is exposed to a young environment, that is exposed to young blood, how does that change? And I'm just summarizing the results here. Um, these were published a while ago. Uh, he could find that there's an increase in hippocampal neurogenesis. There's an increase in synaptic activity. Genes that neuroscientists have described to be involved in uh, synaptic plasticity tend to be uh, increased in these old mice exposed to young. There's also an increase in spine density, and there's a reduction in the reactive microglia. And some of this, uh, the reactive microglia has actually worked as is still under investigation. But most importantly, uh, he could then show, Saul could show that simply transferring plasma from young mice to old had actually effects on memory and could improve the memory in multiple uh, behavioral tests. We also see the opposite, um, that the young mouse exposed to the old shows reduced neurogenesis, reduced synaptic activity, impaired memory function, increased microglial reactivity or neuroinflammation, and if you transfer plasma, you can actually impair cognitive function in these young mice. Do similar factors exist in human blood? We can't go right away. We, we actually are doing a clinical trial. We start a company in humans to see whether this can be applied, for example, to Alzheimer's disease. But first, at the molecular level, can we identify human factors that are sufficient to have this effect? And this is work done by uh, Joe Castellano, a postdoc in the lab, a senior postdoc by now, um, who asked the question, what, the, what happens if I take plasma from young individuals, the young as possible, umbilical cord plasma, young people, 20, age, 20 years of age, or 65 to 70 year old individuals. And you can't transfer human blood straight into a wild type mouse, you would get an immune rejection. Um, so instead, um, what uh, Joe really pioneered is to use an immunodeficient model. These immunodeficient mice, this is actually a strain that is called NSG, they're very stable, they live a perfect uh, normal life in, in our mouse facilities. Um, although they show a slightly accelerated aging phenotype, potentially because they miss part of the immune system. But these mice uh, allow you to inject human plasma repeatedly. And if we just look at the very um, sort of broad level, what happens to the brain if you inject human plasma, uh, what you see, these are six IV injections of a small volume, 150 microliters, so roughly 7% of the total volume of a mouse injected over two weeks. And you can see here, um, Joe injected either vehicle, young plasma, cord plasma, or elderly plasma, and looked at gene expression changes in the hippocampus. And then he did unsupervised clustering, and what you can see first is that, depending on the type of plasma we gave the mice, they induced a, a gene transcription uh, change that was uh, very, um, descriptive of what, what uh, plasma they have been treated with. 
And uh, when you look at the top network in animals that were treated with cord plasma, we see again this network of genes involved in long-term memory and long-term potentiation, similar to what we saw in old mice exposed to young blood. Uh, Joe followed then up on some of these immediate early genes, such as CAM kinase 2, EGR1, John B, or CFOS with independent method uh, by doing qPCR. And you can see there are quite nice um, changes here. Just in, uh, after these six injections of, uh, of plasma, he sees this, this nice uh, doubling of CFOS expression. And he can also confirm this at the cellular level by staining with an antibody against CFOS you can see cord plasma leads to many more cells being uh, activated or expressing CFOS now, and old plasma does not. If you quantify that, you can see roughly a doubling in the number of these CFOS expressing cells with, in mice that are treated with cord plasma. There is no effect if you treat a young mouse. So if you give a young mouse young plasma or cord plasma, we do not see an increase in CFOS expression. Uh, he then also used Li Chen Luo's uh, trap mouse. This is a mouse that have, has a stop flux in, in, in front of the CFOS promoter. So if you activate CFOS, you will uh, induce a CRE in this case and then delete the stop a codon in front of a, a tomato uh, a, a reporter gene. And so cells that are being activated will now be uh, expressing tomato red. And this is actually done with only one single injection of plasma. So this is the protocol Joe injects um, human plasma and then uh, tamoxifen. And then 20, uh, three days later, he takes uh, the brain out, uh, looks at which cells have been activated. And you can see very nicely here that uh, if you treat with vehicle or old plasma, you have the same number of these um, uh, trapped cells. So these are cells that were uh, where CFOS was activated, but you get about a threefold increase if you inject cord plasma into these mice, suggesting again there is direct effects on immediate early gene expression. The functional consequences of this uh, are quite uh, uh, remarkable too, we think. So for this, we use uh, the so called Barnes maze. Uh, this is a, this is a um, memory test or spatial um, uh, placement uh, test where a spatial location test where the mice have to find um, on this, uh, in this maze the single hole where they can escape from this um, environment they, they don't like. So this is a table with a lot of different holes and the bright light shining on it, and the mice don't like this environment. And we train them over four days to find the one hole where they can escape in a dark tube and feel more comfortable. And they use these spatial cues to form a, a spatial map in their brains. And they are actually very good when they're young to do that. But when they're old, they have really great difficulties performing this task, as you can see in this uh, old mouse here. So this mouse was trained for four days, four trials per day, to remember where this um, escape hole is here. And we change, actually, the location of the escape hole every day. So it's pretty challenging to do this test. And you can see this mouse has no clue. Um, it really can't uh, perform this task. The next mouse I'm going to show you is a sibling of this mouse, so same age, um, an old mouse, um, but it was injected with cord plasma um, every three days for three weeks, and just with a small amount of cord plasma, again, about 150 microliters per injection IV, so systemic delivery of, of this young plasma. And uh, you already notice from the start, this mouse shows a, a different behavior that I think we, we see quite frequently. It doesn't just start running away, uh, but it's almost as it, if orient itself, where am I? And then escapes. This is the best mouse we ever had. <laughs> I make this joke every time. Uh, it's not actually, um, so here, here is um, the statistical analysis of this, and you can see the four days, the four trials each day. Of course, on the first day, they can't know what they're supposed to do, and we sort of shove them towards the hole so they understand the test. Uh, but you can already see a separation on day two, day three, and then clearly day four. The mice that got cord plasma compared to saline, or you could also take old plasma here, you would see the same effect. Um, 
show a significant improvement in learning. And just for your comparison, if you look in this strain of mice at young versus aged mice, this is what um, a young mouse achieves in this, in this, in this Barnes maze um, after four days of training. And you can see they clearly do better than the ones that got uh, cord plasma. But um, we did, of course, not uh, study at the pharmacological uh, dynamics of this effect. So this is just one injection every three days. And if we could maybe concentrate that or deliver it more often, it's not unreasonable to think that we could achieve sort of almost youthful levels. Um, we've seen Mark Schnitzer presented fear conditioning. This is another test we like to use. And here too, um, the mouse, uh, if it remembers where it was shocked previously, it shows this classical freezing response. If it doesn't remember, it will freeze less. So if this old mouse got PBS, it will freeze 40% uh, of the time. But if it get, got cord plasma previously, then it will freeze uh, much more. Now, we all would like to know what are the factors. And towards identifying these factors, we use proteomics. Um, we described a couple of aging factors. These are actually described by Saul, and he followed up in his own lab with uh, one a particular factor, beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, which is a very interesting protein. It may relate to Carla Schatz's discovery that MHC class 1 and PRB have a role in synaptic plasticity. We don't know yet whether that's the case, but um, the changes that he observed is that beta-2 microglobulin goes up with age and is detrimental for the brain. Uh, the same with eotaxin. And then there are a few factors that have been described in the past by many different groups, uh, again, in, around uh, insulin signaling, such as IGF-1, IGF-2. Growth hormone also has beneficial effects. And I list here only factors that, given systemic administration, have effects on the aged brain in, in, in rodents or even in humans. There was actually a clinical trial with uh, growth hormone releasing hormone. So as I said, we use uh, proteomic uh, approaches to try to see which factors are most consistently changed with age in mice, in humans, change in centenarians, or maybe show a different behavior in, in centenarians where they uh, keep the factor lower or increase it more than, than uh, their uh, younger peers. Um, and then we come up with ranked lists. We also use parabiosis, of course, and we come up with ranked lists, and we can test them in cellular um, or um, uh, slice cultures, but what we mostly do is we actually go straight into mice because it's hard to model this in, in a cell culture or in any other model because we really don't know how the factor interacts with the brain. So we, we like to uh, uh, obtain these uh, proteins in recombinant form, inject them into wild-type mice and, and explore what, what and effects uh, they might have. And this is what Joe did here. Uh, he selected a number of different factors. I show you four of them. Two had no effect on his, he used as a screen, uh, he used CFOS expression in the dentate gyrus again. Uh, but you can see two of these factors, one is called CSF2 and the other one is called TIMP2, show a significant effect on CFOS expression upon recombinant delivery. And he used here a paradigm where he injected these factors in recombinant form, IP, uh, four times. Just a, a couple of words, CSF2, also called colony stimulating, uh, colony stimulating factor two, or also known as GMCSF. This is actually an FDA-approved FDA drug that is given to individuals who get a bone marrow transplant because it's a very powerful um, uh, trophic factor for the myeloid cell lineage, including probably microglial cells as well. Um, so it's in the clinic, it's being used. Uh, it was previously described by Huntington Potter because he uh, argued that immune cells get dysfunctional with aging and with Alzheimer's disease, and so he tested a number of these colony stimulating factors and found CSF2 to be most potent in improving cognition in these Alzheimer mouse models and also reversing amyloid load. So in a way, this is uh, almost like a validation of our approach. This was one of our top hits, and it had been previously implicated to do exactly what we were trying to find, to improve cognitive function, and maybe even have a benefit in a model of neurodegenerative disease. And there is, in fact, a phase two clinical trial conducted by Sanofi Aventis in Alzheimer's disease with this factor. 
But really, for the last few slides, I want to show you the fact that Joe uh, chose to follow up on. And I have to admit, I was not too ex enthusiastic initially when he said he wanted to pursue this factor. Um, but I think he was absolutely right. And, and it could be really exciting what he discovered with this factor. So TIM2 uh, stands for tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases. This is a protein that regulates the activity of proteases. Now, why would that be important? Most of these factors that I showed you, growth factors, such as BDNF, NGF, but throughout the body, they're often produced as propeptides, so they're inactive. And it requires the cleavage by a protease that then makes them, renders them active. And this cleavage, this protease activity is, co uh, is controlled by protease inhibitors. So in a way, all of these factors are part of this intercellular communication, if you will, in the extracellular space. And TIM2 is one of these regulators of this protease activity. So it decreases with age in plasma and in the brain. And I'll show you a little bit of data. It penetrates the blood-brain barrier. This was a very um, um, successful collaboration with Michelle James. Um, uh, in radiology, um, and then uh, systemic administration can enhance cognition, and depletion in plasma actually worsens cognition. So um, if, uh, we, saw, we saw previously the gene set uh, that Nat Heinz uh, produced, and luckily for us, uh, there was actually a mouse available also. Uh, this, this mouse drives a reporter um, in, under, the TIM2, uh, under the control of TIM2, and you can see here, if I, if I zoom in on the hippocampus, there's a very um, interesting distribution of cells in the hilus that express TIM2. And when Joe actually looked how they change with age, uh, he, he could find a, an antibody that is specific, uh, that did not stay in knockout brains. Um, and with age, you see actually a loss of expression in these neurons, and he's following up now on what are these neurons exactly doing, and are they actually being lost. But TIM2 expression decreases here in, in, in these specific neurons. Um, TIM2 also decreases in plasma. That's how he discovered it. So it decreases in the periphery and uh, in the brain. And when you, um, there's a lot of different uh, data that he uh, produced, but I'll just show you um, a couple here. Um, electrophysiological recordings from uh, slices uh, of the hippocampus, and these are um, uh, uh, LTP uh, recordings here on, on slices in dentate granule neurons, and you see um, how this um, factor TIM2, when it's injected in recombinant form systemically into old mice, uh, maintains LTP here uh, very nicely um, as, control, as compared to control, um, and he actually finds the same if he inhibits TIM2 activity in a young slice uh, with an antibody. Uh, what's probably most exciting is if he now takes uh, cord plasma, which I showed you can improve learning and memory in old mice, and he specifically depletes TIM2, he loses almost all of the effect uh, of this cord plasma, as you can see here. So these, this is what I showed you before. Mice that are treated with cord plasma or with cord plasma that was depleted uh, with a control antibody, so just incubated with a control antibody, or then if he depletes him to by 95%, 99% actually with, uh, with a column, he loses the beneficial effect of cord plasma, suggesting that this is a factor that is mo both sufficient and potentially necessary, at least in this model, to confirm part of this re rejuvenating effect that uh, we observed. So to summarize and conclude, development and aging result in prominent changes in secreted signaling proteins, what we like to call the communicome, sort of the proteome of cellular communication factors in plasma. The old mouse and its brain in particular are malleable and can be rejuvenated. And I think that is really uh, probably the, m the main discovery uh, from Randall's lab and, and others that tissues at multi uh, multiple different tissues can be uh, moved towards a younger age at multiple levels, molecular, subcellular, cellular, and functional levels. Young blood factors can reverse aspects of aging. Old blood factors seem to accelerate them. And then circulatory plasma factors from human umbilical cord can ameliorate cognitive deficits in aged mice. And CSF and TIM2 are two example factors. And just to 
put this in perspective and what we think might happen in here. And here I'm, I'm getting really very speculative. But you're, of course, all aware of genetic reprogramming of somatic cells with the Yamanaka factors. So there you can take a cell from an old organism, you can reprogram it, and you arrive at a cell that has age zero, that starts from scratch. So are we maybe doing something similar with, with multiple factors that are present in the plasma of a young organism that stimulate not one specific pathway, but maybe multiple pathways. And that's maybe what, what Joe found with TIM2, that it regulates actually many growth factors. It's not the one factors. Remember, it's a, an inhibitor of metalloproteases, but that it controls many factors that are involved in maintaining tissue health. And so maybe what we do is we do some level of epigenetic programming of different cell types in different tissues. So this is the work of a lot of different people. Um, and I didn't have time to tell you of, uh, about all the different uh, projects that are going on. Um, and again, with uh, different uh, labs here at Stanford that, that uh, make it a lot of fun to explore this. Thank you very much. We do have time for a few questions. If you can get your hands up, that'd be great. We have one here in the center. Hi, Tony. Chris. Has anybody in your lab considered, for example, injecting soluble receptors for uh, eotaxin or beta microglobin to sort of mop those things up and see what the effect was on aging mice? Yes, that's a great question. So basically neutralizing aging factors. Uh, that's definitely something that we're interested in. We haven't done it. Uh, for these two particular factors um, in the periphery, but we did it in, by injecting them in the brain, and you can indeed uh, reduce some of the detrimental uh, effects. Joe did it for Tim too, um, uh, by showing that it's a necessary factor, uh, so sort of the opposite, yeah. Please over here. Hey, I actually have two questions. Can I ask both of them? Sure. Sweet, okay, so the first one, the second to last slide that you showed with, uh, the removing T, TIMP. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what kind of thresholding we see? Because you said you had to like remove 99% of that for it to go back to baseline, right? <coughs> Is it a nice linear relationship? Are we seeing a lot of convolution with other potential uh, signaling pathways? What does that look like, that space? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, you haven't titrated it out, so uh, this is probably what you would want to see. And then um, how, how does that change the whole network of different factors? We, we really don't know that yet. But uh, we have done some uh, proteomic profiling of the leftover. Now, so just a step back, we, we've done the same experiment where we just inject antibody into a wild type, a young mouse, to see whether that reduces cognitive function. And it seems to do that. Um, so suggesting that it's necessary. But then the other experiment that I showed is taking the, the beneficial blood and depleting it. And there um, you can, you, you basically change only that factor. Uh, we don't think that we pre precipitate out a lot of other factors. Whereas if you give the neutralizing antibody into the mouse over several days or weeks, you change, of course, a lot of different factors. Is that sort of your? Uh, and number two, kind of taking a step back, uh, when are we gonna start seeing this in people? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I'm working hard. I'm trying to see if we can get to something against uh, hair loss. Uh, <laughs> but but we, we're, we're, trying, uh, we're trying to do this uh, in Alzheimer's patients right now. So as I mentioned, we started a company, and uh, Alcahest, which is um, uh, funded to uh, basically take it first at the first level to just use young plasma and test it in... Alzheimer's patients, and that, that trial is actually running here uh, in neurology uh, by Sharon Shaw, directed now. Um, and I think we, we hope to wrap it up this year. Um, uh, but the second trial is already uh, planned with, uh, with more controlled plasma, uh, young plasma, um, that is collected through plasmapheresis and uh, in a much larger scale. But really, I think Alzheimer's may not be the best indication, and we really need to find out what is the best potential target to test this concept. Terrific. We have a question over here, please. So, uh, 
question and comment. So first question, uh, exercise has been shown, I th I'm pretty sure, in humans, and I, I seem to recall things in mice where they exercise them, they tend to look younger longer. Um, I know in, in humans that tends to be the case, and have you looked at factors and what overlaps in that? Um, the other thing is I think with Alzheimer's, by the time people show up for clinical tri trials, they're pretty far along and probably aren't, the, you, you need to look for probably the people who are just showing symptoms. Unfortunately, they're probably less desperate to do something research-wise, so Yeah, great, great questions. So um, regarding exercise, I'm glad you're asking this question because I wanted to show this first, but I just couldn't talk faster and squeeze even more in. Um, I'm from a part in Switzerland where people are known to, spo to speak slowly, so I really had to try hard to <laughs> took a few coffee before I started. Um, anyway, uh, exercise seems to, um, as you said, in increases uh, neurogenesis, has a, a lot of benefits in rodents, it's very well documented, increases genes involved in synaptic plasticity. And um, Mike Betley, a graduate student who, who uh, uh, left since, and Suri uh, Miguel, uh, who uh, is still a postdoc in the lab, they actually could show that you can exercise mice, you can take, so young mice, you take their plasma and you inject it into non-exercise mice and you can reproduce the beneficial effects on uh, cognition, uh, not, not on cognition, on neurogenesis. So all you need is a, a young student who exercises and then you have a, a good supply of, of young factors. Um, I agree that Alzheimer's disease may not may be a very complicated target, um, but what we could also look is uh, just as, at frailty and sort of other aspects of cognition in people who are not yet at the clinical uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's. I have a similar question to the colleague yeah. there, but simpler. Did anybody try this with any other animal except for rodents, and is there any similarity in the set of proteins that play an important role? Parabiosis, you mean? Uh, parabiosis has been done in rats. Um, I mean, in the early days when they started, you don't want to know what they did. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, there, there were controlled studies that mainly looked at radiation damage, um, uh, huge cohorts of rats that were lethally radiated and then paired with young animals. Um, so, and, and there's clearly benefits. It's, you know, they, the pairs then live almost a normal life. Um, Non-rodents, no, not to my knowledge. Yeah, there there are some in zebra fish, but just at the um, at the uh, initial uh, embryo level. Uh, I saw a paper. Terrific. We've got time for two more questions, and the people already have the mics so over here. In the really, room. really exciting stuff, Tony. Um, I'm wondering, for example, in injecting uh, young plasma into older uh, mice, how long do these effects last? Is it permanent? Is it through reprogramming, or does it? sort of peter out after a while? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, um, which, again, we have not answered yet. Uh, we're doing epigenetic analysis now and, and look at different time points after treatment. Uh, we're also doing a neurogenesis study and see how long the effects last. I don't have results yet. Um, I don't think they last very long, um, although some of the changes are clearly at the cellular and subcellular level and they, they, they can't just disappear uh, very quickly. But I think if you translated that into a treatment, you would probably maintain individuals on a regular you know, treatment regimen like you have with antibodies or, or other biologics where you treat them once a month or something like that. And over here. Since you mentioned Switzerland, I cannot help but ask the question, uh, some 80 years ago, Paul Niehans uh, started injecting human beings, very wealthy human beings, with uh, extract of fetal lamb. Yes, and they still do that. <laughs> they all flocked to Switzerland, saying they were rejuvenated. What do you think of that? <laughs> Has no scientific basis. No, but people do it. Yeah, they still do it. I, I was just at Lake Geneva where they do this. No, not to, to visit them, but it was brought up as well. <laughs> but it was brought up again, yeah. yeah. All right, well, we'll have to wait and see what happens for humans with a scientific basis. Thank you, Tony. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.